the keys are to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time. Welcome to the show, everyone. It's Victory Monday. The San Francisco 49ers got a big win over their rival Seattle Seahawks. And now we're sitting back. We're thinking about the fact 49ers handled the NFC West in a big way. And now they're sitting in the number one seed because thank you, Dallas Cowboys. You have dispatched of the Philadelphia Eagles. And it's an exciting day to be a 49ers fan. You got 10 wins. You only have three losses. You're sitting at number one in your division, number one in your conference. And you've only got four games left to finish these things off and get number one seed in the playoffs and home field advantage. And that's exactly what the 49ers wanted to do, what they needed to do. And they beat their division rival, Seattle Seahawks, 28 to 16. And it was a great performance for the San Francisco 49ers. They really went out and they handled business. Now, there were some things that weren't perfect. This was not by far their best game. You know, they came off a really, really fine performance against the Philadelphia Eagles. And this one was a little bit scaled back. They weren't as dynamic as far as taking care of the football. Their defense did give up some things at times. But in the grand scheme of things, this is what you have to do to win. They're not going to all be blowout, easy victories for the 49ers. As Fred Warner said a few weeks ago, they need some grimy games. Well, it doesn't get more grimy than playing your division rival. And the Seattle Seahawks came in back against the walls, a wounded animal, ready to go out there and defeat the San Francisco 49ers. But their early push, their early try did not succeed. The 49ers were able to weather the storm, much like they did against Philadelphia, weather the storm, and then they absolutely took off. And let's be honest, couple plays here or there go a different way. The 49ers could have easily have blown out the Seattle Seahawks and not never looked back. Uh, Mitch Wyszkowski's punt, get, a punt fake, getting called back. Uh, that one was huge momentum-wise. And Brandon Ayuk fumbling the football. That was huge as well. So, yes, it wasn't a perfect performance, but you have to win some of these games because these are how things are going to happen when you get to the playoffs. It's not going to all be perfect. It's not going to be rainbows and butterflies. Things are going to come your way that are going to make it difficult, and you have to be able to overcome obstacles to win football games. And that's exactly what the 49ers did. And it was a fun performance. Uh, We've seen Brock Purdy and Debo Samuel go deep down the field, explode for a touchdown. George Kittle got involved in the action. There's a deep ball to Brandon Ayuk as well. Deep shot Brock was a real thing, and he was out there executing the offense. He broke his record for most yards in a game. He threw for 368 It's a great performance. And in this episode, we're going to get all into the performance. We're going to hear from Kyle Shanahan about what happened at halftime. I know a lot of people were wondering what was going on with his halftime decisions. We'll get into that. Hear from Debo and Brock about the deep ball success. And we'll also hear from Fred about DK. So I got some clips. They're cut up. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get into it deep in this episode. I'll talk about my offense and defensive players of the game. And we'll just get into the the action of this matchup because it was a really, really good one. But first, Bet Online remains your top spot for all your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, and NHL are in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, for your 50% welcome bonus. On your first deposit, bet online where the game starts. And this was a gritty performance that the 49ers absolutely needed. And it got started right off the bat with Christian McCaffrey hitting a 72 yard run. And during the 49ers' first five weeks of the season, when they were absolutely rolling, this was the norm. The 49ers were getting explosive runs from Christian McCaffrey in Pittsburgh week one, explosive run. In week two versus the Rams, explosive run down the left side where he puts a killer witherspoon in the ground with a stiff arm against the Dallas Cowboys, explosive run. This was the norm for the San Francisco 49ers. 
And guess what? You get a healthy Trey Williams. You get a healthy Aaron Banks. You get George Kittle, Kyle Juszczyk blocking on the edge, and a back like Christian McCaffrey that has the vision and capabilities that he does, and you get absolutely explosive plays down the field. This is the kind of thing that opens up everything. We are talking about this week, our number one key matchup for the offense was the 49ers run game versus the Seattle Seahawks defense, and it took one play for the 49ers to make the Seattle Seahawks commit to stopping the run. After that, they had to make sure that they were going to stop the San Francisco 49ers run game because if not, Christian McCaffrey and this 49ers offense was absolutely going to run them over, and they couldn't allow that to happen. They can't allow the 49ers just to run them over, so they did bring guys up in the box. They were more committed to stopping the run, and ultimately that helps the 49ers offense in a big way because we've talked about this before. Early early success in the run game establishes play action. It allows for big play potential down the field. But I want to listen to what McCaffrey had to say because McCaffrey talked about his run, what he's looking at, how it's a one-gap type style. He's going gap to gap, but also how one of his wide receivers downfield, he loves it. And it just goes to show what this team is all about. No block, no rock. And when you've got big-time players out there making plays, blocking, uh, and playing unselfish, you get excited, and it just kind of trends through the rest of the team. So let's hear McCaffrey on about that play that first big run of 72 yards? Uh, I mean, you never know till it does. You know, you just, um, you kind of just read it one gap at a time and trust the guys in front of you. And uh, that was, I mean, amazing blocking. I uh, got a score there, you know, but that was, you know, great job by those guys up front all day. Um, BA blocking downfield, 75 yards down the field again, which is just becoming routine for him. So I appreciated that. But that was a great job by all those guys up front. You've got a player like Brandon Ayuk, a 1,000-yard receiver, back-to-back seasons, by the way. Congratulations to Brandon Ayuk. What an achievement. You've went back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. You've proved your worth, especially to the 49ers. But he's 75 yards downfield blocking. That's the kind of mentality that the San Francisco 49ers playmakers and team have. How spectacular is that, that Christian McCaffrey sees Brandon Ayuk blocking I remember the play, and I remember him getting up and going right to Ayuk and celebrating because he knew how important it was that Ayuk is all the way downfield. And if you want to see this type of blocking, you have to go back to some of the heydays of the 49ers when you would see Jerry Rice and John Taylor. And I'm going to give him props, even Terrell Owens, for going downfield, that Garrison Hurst big-time run in overtime against the Jets. That was Terrell Owens going down the field and making things happen. Would you have that intent as an offense and as playmakers to help players when you don't have the ball in your hand? That's when great things happen. And that's why this team is showing greatness because they're willing to help each other and make big-time plays. I love McCaffrey's explanation on it, talking about gaps. And if you watch that play, and Pete Carroll says that they practiced that to stop that play all week, Well, you know what happened? Some guys overcommitted to stopping that run. And when you have a running back like Christian McCaffrey that has the vision, but also the capabilities to get his foot in the ground and get vertical, but still have his eyes upfield to make sure he makes the necessary cuts and reads, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was just an all-around great play from the blocking to McCaffrey's vision to the downfield blocking by Brandon Ayuk. And those types of plays just open up everything for everyone else. And that early success provided opportunities for the 49ers in the passing game. That's part of the reason Brock Purdy throws for 368 yards in this game. That's part of the reason the 49ers explode for over 500 yards on offense because of explosive plays like this. And of course, this is the precursor to explosive plays all over the place for the 49ers. And I thought it was interesting. Someone actually asked in the presser, and I didn't cut it up, but you had situations before And they asked Kyle Shanahan this. They had situations before where it felt like the 49ers were more a methodical offense. They had to work down the field consistently. They didn't have the explosives. Before, it used to just be if Debo Samuel happened to break one. That's how they had an explosive touchdown. And occasionally, same thing for George Kittle. But now it seems like any player at any time can have an explosive. And when you have that, that's when you are extremely, extremely dangerous. And Brock Purdy had a comment on this. I want you guys to hear what Brock Purdy had to say about him and the 49ers playmakers and their effect on this offense. Yeah, I mean, it's 
I'm a, I'm a part of a special group, you know. Um, any one of our guys, any any one of our eligibles, man, you get the ball in their hands and then they can go do the rest. You know, break tackles, obviously have pull, pull away, breakaway speed. Um, and I mean, we see it every game. So to throw like a five-yard pass or even a deep ball, it doesn't matter. Um, we got playmakers. Special playmakers, right? Whether it's five yards and they take it to the house or whether it's a deep vertical throw, They've got guys that can take you to the house at any moment, and they really do. How many teams in the NFL have a player like Christian McCaffrey that can explode from the running back position consistently, not just on the ground, but through the air, right? He has over 50 catches on the season from the running back position. Absolutely dynamic. I mean, we haven't seen this kind of running back efficiency since probably Marshall Falk. Uh, The guy is just ridiculously good and perfect fit for 49ers offense and Kyle Shanahan. Then you look at Debo. He's the ultimate game changer. He makes things happen on the ground. He makes things happen in the air. But if you give this guy an inch of daylight, right, to quote Gail Sayers, an inch of daylight or six inches of daylight is all I need. So we'll say six inches of daylight is all I need. That's Debo Samuel. And sometimes he doesn't even need six inches of daylight because he bounces right off you. Like pinball, boom, hit, nope, I'm gone. You have to make sure you do everything you can to stop Debo Samuel. He's an absolute playmaker. And just what you think that they don't have more. Brandon IU can have a big explosive play down the field, which he did in this game of over 40. George Kittle had a 44-yard touchdown in this game. Explosive play. Too many explosive weapons. And just what do you think? You've got the big four hemmed up. Brock Purdy, because he's a special player too, will find Jawan Jennings, and Jawan Jennings will make a special play. Specialty does not stay with those four guys, but it rubs off on everyone. From Trent Williams making a special block, to Kyle Juszczyk making a special block, to guys making special runs and special tackles. It is transcending through this entire team. That's how you get elite football play. And right now, the 49ers have some playmakers that are creating some real problems. And that's exactly what you needed to do. Because not only did they establish the run game, but then they started taking advantage of those big plays downfield. And we talked about the run game getting going and that making linebackers eager eager to come up and, and stop that run. It also made safeties eager. And the Seattle Seahawks decided that they were going to run a lot of lurk and a lot of robber and go ahead and bring one of those safeties into that intermediate part of the field and try to limit Brock's uh, you know, footballs over the middle because he had so much success against the Eagles. The Seahawks had extra time, three extra days to prepare. And let's be honest, they looked prepared, especially on defense. They came out with a good game plan against the 49ers. Of course come out and you want to take something away, you leave something else open. And that's exactly what happened in this football game. They left other things open, vertical plays down the field. We've talked about Jamal Adams before. You put Jamal Adams in the box, you bring him on blitzes, uh, you let him play against screens and play against the run game. He's effective. He's a solid player in those categories. Uh, He's a good tackler, usually. I know last week against Dallas, he had five missed tackles. But normally he's a good tackler. He's pretty instinctive. But when he gets in coverage, there can be some real problems. And they were going with some three safety looks. Some They're playing him in that Buffalo nickel roll, right? right? We heard Steve Wilkes talk about Isaiah Oliver potentially playing the Buffalo nickel this season against the bigger matchups. That's exactly what uh, Seattle was employing in this game. They were employing a a Buffalo nickel of going ahead and putting him in certain situations in the box and also situations downfield. And the 49ers were able to take advantage of those because they knew exactly what they were looking at route-wise. Now, one thing I felt I found interesting was, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago now, Eric Armstead had Brandon Ayuk on his show. And Brandon Ayuk said one thing that was really different from playing with other quarterbacks on the 49ers was Brock Purdy, you always had to be ready to get the football. Even if you were running complimentary routes, you were on the backside of something, you had to be prepared because you might get the football. And he said that was different from normal. Normally, if you were on the backside of a route concept, so the one and two were on this side, you just ran your route over here. So maybe you didn't have to go as hard, right? You didn't have to run it with uh, such intensity. And so he said that, and that really opened things up. Number one, that signals to everyone that Brock Purdy's going through all of his reads. He's going one, two, three, four, and able to find guys on the backside of the progression, which means mastery of the offense. When you're looking at other quarterbacks, and this is no fault to them, 
This is pretty consistent. In fact, uh, if you watch the Sunday Night Football game, Chris Collinsworth was hyping up the fact that Dak Prescott said now in his, their system, he goes one, two, and then makes something happen. Okay, great. That's what like half the NFL uh, quarterbacks do in this league. One, two, read, and then run. Uh, so, so that's great. Not Brock Purdy. One, two, three, four in this game, finding Debo. Uh, last week against Philadelphia, one, two, three, four, five, finding George Kittle for a first down. Imagine that. And he's go he's not going through the progressions like deliberate. It's like so fast that he's reading these things. And that gives him the opportunity to make big time plays down the field. And that's exactly what you need uh, from the San Francisco 49ers and from Brock Purdy. And I want you to listen to what Brock Purdy had to say about the deep ball uh, before we listen to what Debo had to say about it as well. But listen to Brock. He's going to give you some insight on what he's seen from Jamal Adams and why he was willing to go ahead and rip this football. Um, I feel like we've always, you know, sort of had, sh you know, shots within plays. Um, if the defense gives us a look, we take it. And so um, was I afraid to go deep or anything like that last year? I don't think so. Um, this year, I feel like just more aware of, you know, what our offense is and where guys are supposed to be. And if the defense gives us, gives us a look, I'm more... I guess, ready for it and aware of it. So I have taken deep shots this year. So, yeah. I love that he's willing to take these shots, right? Uh, there's always been shots inside the offense that they have been willing to go ahead and take. Uh, but now you're getting Brock Purdy taking deep balls down the field. And he talked about the fact uh, that he got Jamal Adams, saw Jamal Adams flat-footed. And that's something, right, that you have to be on your game if you're reading. Jamal Adams flat-footed means you're going to rip this football. It, it's just that's the kind of level we're getting from Brock Purdy right now in the quarterback play. He's a legit MVP caliber player. Uh, he's thrown for over 3,500 yards. His completion percentage is through the roof. He leads in almost every single category. He's having an MVP caliber season. And when you're talking about a 49ers offense that was really predicated before Brock Purdy on a horizontal scheme that would stretch a defense horizontally and then take advantage of the middle of the field where a lot of the issues that the four years had to come up with was how to move people horizontally to create a horizontal stretch to get the ball into a tight window. That's how Jimmy Garoppolo went about running this offense because about 25 yards in is kind of what his box was. Now you've got Brock Purdy, where not only can you stretch them horizontally and create those windows, but vertically as well. So next thing you know, you're taking advantage of not just guys in a horizontal stretch, but a vertical stretch. And if you've been noticing that windows are a lot bigger this year than they were with Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback, that's the reason. Because now defenses are having to cover a larger area. Linebackers are having to get a deeper drop or in some cases stop McCaffrey in the run game. So they open up the middle of the field. But if you want to go to the concepts that Seattle was trying to run with a lurk concept, Things like that, a cover three buzz, the what Jamal Adams got caught in. Those are situations where the deep vertical pass is open. Before, defenses could get away with it. They could muddy up the middle of the field and take the 49ers offense away from them. Not now. Because Brock Purdy's able to throw every throw you want to make. Outside the numbers vertically, boom. Deep down the middle of the field vertically, boom. You want to throw him, you want to throw a short pass horizontally to the left or right? He's got it. Over the middle of the field, throws with accuracy. There's not a throw right now that I haven't seen Brock Purdy be able to make. And if you do get pressure on him, he can escape the pocket and then whip the ball down the field to Brandon Ayuk. Rolling left, gets his hips in the right position, drives through the football, and not just throws a great pass, but throws Brandon Ayuk open. That's what's so spectacular. Ayuk's doing a scramble drill. He starts to drift, and then he throws it further down the field to take Ayuk away from the defender. These are elite caliber throws that Brock Purdy's making. And that's why this offense is at another level. This offense is starting to equal the greatest show on turf with 9.9 .9 yards per completion. That's spectacular, right? That's almost a first down for every single throw that Brock Purdy makes and completes. You look at the stat line for this game and Debo, Brandon Ayuk, and George Kittle were all over 21 yards per catch. George Kittle over 25 yards per catch. These guys are tearing it up. They have a real opportunity to have four players for the 49ers go over 1,000 yards from scrimmage. Christian McCaffrey's already done it. Brandon Ayuk's already done it.
George Kittle and Debo Samuel are on their way. And let's be honest right now. Debo is playing at another level. If Debo is going to play at this level, this is 21, 2021 or better caliber. How are you stopping this offense? You come in, you want to stop McCaffrey, or you want to stop Debo? You want to stop both? Have fun with Ayuk and George Kittle. I don't know. I don't see it. Every game we go into now, I just wonder how a team stops the 49ers offense. Do you have enough weaponry on defense to be able to stop their offense? I don't know. Not while healthy. This offense has been spectacular. They haven't scored less than 27 points in a game when Debo Samuel and Trent Williams are out there. Tampa Bay, 27. Seattle, uh, Sunday, 28. Besides that, over 30 every time. Now, without Trent Williams, without Debo Samuel, they were a 17-point uh, a game team. Now, I think they are better than that. I think they should have scored more in those football games. But Trent Williams, just running behind him, adds an extra two yards per carry. Just running to the left side. That's crazy. Then you throw in the effect of Debo. You have to worry, is he going to run? Is he going to get in the, the catch? He's got the playmaker ability. you got to worry about tackling him in the open field. He goes that way. Do I go with him? Do we send multiple guys that way? He catches it, and it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. It's an advantage, Debo Samuel. So he just creates so many avenues. But let's hear what Debo had to say about Brock Purdy's deep pass. I think it gives us a real good idea of not just what Debo's doing and how Debo can run everything in the tree now, and how he's really uh, just at another level, but also Brock's mastery of the offense. Brock's mastery of the offense is being illustrated through these plays that he's making, but also the things that his uh, players are saying about him and coaches as well. But uh, in this case, his wide receiver, Debo Samuel. Um, you know, it's crazy as, as we worked that play at practice, that was like the last option to be thrown. And so, uh, you know, Brock just being the quarterback he is and just whenever he sees something, he's going to let it go. As you can see, like I really wasn't running like 100 miles per hour. But once I seen, I looked back and seen Brock getting ready to cock and throw it, I had to speed up. But um, that's just something that we work on every, every year in camp and we slowly progressing to get better at it. It was the fourth option. Debo Samuel was the last option on that play. He wasn't even running full speed. Right, and, and if you've watched breakdowns, right, people often talk about Debo Samuel not going 100% on the backside. Well, go back. What did we just talk about? Ayuk's comments. You were on the backside before. You never got the ball. So why waste your energy? It's not the proper uh, coaching point, right? You always want them to go 100%, but that's what these players were thinking. I'm not going to get the ball. Well, now you heard right here, he wasn't running full speed. But he looked back and saw Brock Purdy about to unleash this ball and took off. Jamal Adams is flat-footed. Jamal Adams buzzed forward. He's taken away uh, the coverage he's supposed to, and they don't normally make this throw. And because they don't normally make it and they haven't had a quarterback capable of consistently making this throw, defenses weren't worried about it. You know what defenses are now? Worried about it. You know what's going to be open now? The deep crosser. Things are going to start to change a little bit because teams are going to have to play deep. And that was one of the things Brock said. And Kyle you know, said the same exact thing. Seattle normally plays very soft coverage, keeps everything underneath, doesn't allow explosives. Explosives were here. Three explosive throws in this game. One to Debo for a touchdown. One to Kittle for a touchdown. One to Brandon Ayuk for a deep play down the field. And a explosive run with Christian McCaffrey. The offense was dynamic in this game. And what does that do for a defense, right? I mean, what does that mean for a defense when they know that they've got an offense that can play at this level, that they've got an offense that can go and score with the best of them? Well, we know the 49ers have the best scoring defense in the entire league. They give up right around 16 points a game. It's spectacular. Last year was 16.9. They're better than that right now. And they just went through a stretch where they played Seahawks, Eagles, Seahawks. And that number didn't barely go up at all. They just don't give up points. And you have an offense that scores a lot. If you only give up 16 points a game and your offense is averaging 28, you're plus 12. You're almost plus a a two touchdowns every single game you go into. That's exactly why it's easier to play defense because we know a part of the success of the 2019 defense for the 49ers was the fact that the 49ers played from in front. So teams down the stretch had to pass a lot. That's when that defensive line becomes hunters. 
That's when Chris Kacarek and his front unit that includes Nick Bosa get after people. They go hard. And the reason they can do that is because they don't have to worry about the run game anymore. And the 49ers early success against that Seattle Seahawks run game. And I'll be honest, I thought Zach Charbonnet had some good runs in this game. But when you look at the stats, he only had 44 yards. Kenneth Walker only had 21. They only had 70 yards on the ground. So the 49ers did their job. And by the time Seattle looks up and they see the 49ers have a big lead, they have to get away from the run game. They don't have enough time. They don't have enough possessions. So then the 49ers defensive line is able to pin their ears and go. So that effect of the offense has on the defense is huge. They make it easier. They make them able to play free. They make them able to play more aggressive, less reactionary, and more invoking. Right? They get to get after them, and I love it. So let's hear what Fred says about the offense and why it's so important for this 49ers defense to see an offense like they Absolutely. have. Absolutely, every time. And I've spoken on it plenty of times of how explosive our offense is, and it's just a matter of time before they make a big, a big play down the field or a, a huge run. I mean, the way they started the game was incredible. Um, you know, I think as a team, we just got to be more consistent. Uh, you know, today was a little sloppy uh, throughout the game on all on through all phases, and we still found a way to win, which is what most important. And uh, we just got to continue to get better. It was sloppy. It wasn't perfect, but you know when you have those type of plays. He talked about how awesome it was to see McCaffrey go out and make that big play. McCaffrey make that huge run. It set the tone for the game. And let's give credit to Seattle. I mean, they answered right back. The 49ers threw a haymaker. They scored in two plays. And Seattle came right back down the field and scored on the big throw to DK Metcalf. But then you got to, in turn, give the 49ers defense credit. They were scrambling a little bit when Charvarius Ward got hurt. When Charvarius got, Ward got hurt, we seen Sam Womack in the game for a second. Uh, then we seen Isaiah Oliver in the slot. And it was Guillermo Lenore on the outside. And the 49ers had to pivot away from what they planned on doing. They planned on putting, you know, Traverius Ward out there on DK Metcalf and then having Ambry Thomas and Diomar Lenore do what they normally do. Nickel situations, Ambry's on the outside, Demo's inside. But that was completely put into a state of flux, and you saw it early. Isaiah Oliver got beat for, from Tyler Lockett for a first down, and I'm sure a lot of people were like, oh, no, Isaiah Oliver's going to struggle again. But the 49ers secondary rallied. Ambry Thomas, yes, he got beat, but it didn't get him down, right? It wasn't a Kelly Witherspoon situation where a negative play got into his psyche. No, he went out there and he battled and he competed and he showed grit. And Diameter Lenore is special. He's a hyena. He gets after everybody. Diameter Lenore took it upon himself to be the number one corner after Charverius Ward got hurt. And he succeeded. He was out there competing. He was taking DK on one on one. I don't care. He's got him. I love that mentality, and I love the way the secondary is rallying. How much of that is the secondary coach? How much of that is talent? How much of that is Steve Wilkes? I don't know, but I love it. I love that they're going out there and competing, and they're battling, and they're making things happen because they could have fell apart. It could have been like, you know what? Our number one corner's out. We just don't have the talent, but the 49ers responded in a big way. And yes, the 10 points happened early on in that football game. But after that, DK Metcalf, no catches. Nothing. You get nothing. Intercepted passes right in front of him. Jair Brown over the top. Boom. T interception. It was a great performance by the 49ers secondary and a gritty performance because they had to step up. Linebacker room. Oren Burke starting Sam linebacker. Goes down with a knee injury. Demetrius Flanagan foul steps in, steps up, and makes plays. Javon Hargrave goes down. Rest of the rotation gets in there and makes things happen. Defensive ends go in and play defensive tackle when they have to on obvious pass downs. Now, I thought that was going to be a part of the game plan, but still, you're seeing the depth of the 49ers be able to step up, and that next man up mentality is always the right mentality. But when you have guys that can actually do it, it makes it great. Look at Javon Kinlaw. Started in place of Eric Armstead, and he walks out with a half a sack, a huge tackle for loss, but really helped limit the run game of Seattle Seahawks. This is exactly what you need when you're a championship caliber football team. You need your depth to stand up when your starters go down. And they have to bridge the gap until they get back. Armstead will be back in a week or two. Maybe he'll be back this week. We'll find out. Hargrave, not so sure. Time of recording, no clue. Could be a hamstring pull and he could be out for a while. We don't know. But we do know the 49ers are going to be able to compete inside. And they've got edge defenders that can put pressure on the quarterback. So they're sitting pretty comfortable in what's going on. So the defense 
great. Now, one situation the defense was in was at the end of the first half, and a lot of people came through the reaction show, and they said, hey, Ant, what's up with Kyle? Why didn't he use his timeouts? Seattle was pinned back. They, they had the opportunity, a legal forward pass. Get the ball back. Let something happen for the offense. You're up 14-10. The Seattle Seahawks are going to get the ball back coming out of half. What's going on? And you know what? I couldn't figure it out. I thought for sure the way that Kyle's been all year, he's been aggressive, he's been putting the ball in Brock Purdy's hands. He wants to end the half with the football or he wants to end it with barely any time and a scoring opportunity. And in this case, all of a sudden he lets it run. It reminded me of 2021, 2019, like conservative Kyle. I, don't, I have a quarterback that could make a mistake, Kyle. I have an offense that I don't completely trust, Kyle. And I was like, that's weird. Well, the good news is Kyle cleared this thing up. Kyle Shanahan spoke to the media after the game and cleared it up. And apparently, there was a lot of confusion. So let's hear from Kyle Shanahan about what happened at the end of the half. And maybe it'll kind of ease your mind and get an understanding of what Kyle was thinking. Because I think we all had similar thoughts. And maybe Kyle did as well. No, we went back and forth on it. Um, and then I ended up not liking my decision. Um, it's kind of right in between there. I had enough timeouts. Um, we, we said no, then we said yes. And then I was confused because when they did take the 10 seconds off and it was after an incomplete completion, I couldn't figure out why they were running it again. Um, none of us knew, uh, so it was just an unusual rule. So I just talked to the ref, and he said it is a weird rule, um, but that's how they do it. Even if it's a dead ball, if you take a 10-second runoff, they can still start the clock. And once that started happening, we were surprised by it, then we just let it go in and half. He's frustrated with his own decision, right? Uh, so I think there was some confusion, and that's what he was saying about coming out, and I thought the same thing. I thought that the incomplete pass, because the ball was stopped, and I, I thought this was the rule, if the play resulted in the ball being, you know, the, there being a dead ball, that the 10-second runoff doesn't always happen, right? But you have the penalty. Uh, so I think Kyle saw the incomplete pass and thought, yeah, they're going to do a 10-second runoff, and then they're going to start the ball on the snap. But they wound it as soon as they spotted the ball, and I don't think he realized that. So he didn't use his timeouts. By the time that they realized that, and they were confused, and they asked him the ref on the sideline, a lot of time had run off. By the time that happens, you have to just go ahead and let it run into half. So I wish there would have been more communication from the refs to Kyle Shanahan. Now Kyle will know the situation, and this won't happen again. But I wish the refs would have said, hey, Kyle, just so you know, if you don't decline that 10-second runoff, as soon as we set the ball, we're going to wind the clock. Then he would have had a better understanding, knew he could have used his timeouts, and potentially got the ball back for his football team. Uh, with it being lost and down, they definitely could have got the ball back in pretty good field position with an opportunity to give Jake Moody a chance for a field goal. It was a missed opportunity, but at least we know it's an a, a opportunity that he didn't squander because he was being conservative, but because he didn't understand. And I think sometimes this happens. Now, if it happens again, then that's on Kyle. Uh, but I think he, you know, just listening to what he had to say, he doesn't like that. He wants to be aggressive. He wants to go make things happen. He knows he's got playmakers that can do it. And I think just the recent history has proven that that's who Kyle Shadehan is. So clarity about what happened at half. Ultimately, I mean, it's not what really any of us want to hear because we want him to go out there and know all the rules and make everything happen. But with the amount of rules that are in the NFL, there's always some that just are hard to figure out. And there's so many different little intricacies off of them. Uh, it's confusing. But uh, yeah, I look for Kyle Shadehan to continue to be very aggressive. He likes doubling up teams at the end of the half. And I think that's what he's going to do. He's going to be very measured with that. He likes to end the, end the half with the ball in his hands or with a scoring opportunity. And then he likes to double it up when he has an opportunity to get the ball in the second half. Those two for ones, that was huge against Philly. And so that's definitely something that Kyle wants to do. And I think that's more on brand. What we heard from him is that, hey, I'm mad at myself. I was a little confused and it didn't work out. I think we can all let this one go. 49ers get the big victory and we just kind of move on. But yeah, great, per great performance by the 49ers overall. But there was still something that happened in this game that was a little interesting. So Chase Young, by the way, bravo to Chase Young. Randy Gregory had a sack. And then Chase Young should get some sort of credit, right, for that interception that Fred Warner gets. He gets his, ball, his hand on the ball. And, I mean, Drew Locke's able to get the ball out, but it's fluttering. It reminds me of the ball last year. Uh, when you know Nick Bosa gets there and the ball's floating in the air and then Tashawn Gibson comes up with the interception in overtime. 
Like, that's exactly what it looked like. And so the ball comes fluttering out. Fred Warner makes the pick. Now, because of this, we get DK Metcalf making a tackle on Fred. He's holding Fred up. Fred pitches the ball to Dre, and he throws down Fred Warner. He, he you know, uh, belly-to-back suplexes him, takes him to Suplex City, uh, a la Brock Lesnar. And Fred doesn't like it. And Fred comes through and hits DK from behind. Now, I've heard this thing fun and twisted so that it was actually Fred was, didn't want to have DK running down Dre Greenlaw because we've seen him in the past. Whatever. He hit him in the back, wasn't penalized. It could have been penalized. But Fred gets under DK's skin, and it creates an opportunity for DK to come up and grab his face mask. Of course, we know what ends up happening. DK uh, gets thrown out of the game. Yamar Lenore came up, pushed DK. I don't think that's what got him kicked out. I think he did uh, throw some sort of a hand or a fist towards Jake Bobo. I don't know if he intended to hit Jake Bobo, but he hit him when they had a little bit of scrum on the outside, and he gets thrown out. And they asked Fred about this because I think they wanted to know what was going to be said in the, you know, after the game about Fred. And of course, Fred's got to be coy, right? He can't say everything, but I thought this was interesting. It reminded me a lot of McCaffrey with the Killer Witherspoon uh, when, you know, they had some a verbal after McCaffrey had the explosive and threw a Killer Witherspoon in the, gra- in the ground. And McCaffrey said, hey, I was just asking him how he's, how he's been uh, and how he's doing. And this kind of had a little bit similar, similar feel. But you could just see the mannerisms of Fred Warner and the way he's going about this. It's absolutely hilarious. Uh, Fred talking about DK. Here it is. Yeah, I don't know what happened, man. He, I told him he, he he tackles really well, and then for some reason he didn't like that. And you know, I guess what happened happened, and it's unfortunate, man. He got to learn to keep his composure. But happy we came out with the dub. Told him he tackles good. Didn't like that. Got to keep his composure. Yeah, Fred definitely told him his tackle was good. I can guarantee he didn't tell him that. He told him he tackled like something else, and it got under DK's skin. And let's be honest, they were under DK's skin the whole time. From Yamina Lenore to Ambry Thomas uh, to Fred Warner, they were getting under DK's skin. He kept trying to walk up on guys. Uh, you could tell he was upset. He was not getting going. He got nothing after that touchdown. And he does not like that. And so the 49ers were under his skin the whole time. Ambry Thomas got under Jackson Smith and Jigba's skin. Let's be honest. It's starting to wear on the Seattle Seahawks that they've lost five consecutive times to the San Francisco 49ers. And that DK Metcalf is starting to get handled. He didn't like that Charverius Ward handled him last time. And he thought this was going to be different. And when Charverius Ward is out, he probably thought, hey, this is my game. And then he got absolutely shut down. And he got shut down by a third-round pick in Ambry Thomas, a fifth-round pick in Yamar Lenore, a uh, a third-round pick in Jair Brown. And they were just handling business. And DK's back there, and he's frustrated. And he started breaking stuff. He started throwing his helmets. That's when you knew it was over. The Seattle Seahawks are falling apart. Can they get it together enough to beat the Philadelphia Eagles on Monday night? I don't know. If they don't, their season's done. They will not make the playoffs. If they do win, they still have a chance, and we'll see. Maybe they'll get to play the 49ers again. Don't know. But the 49ers were executing at such a high level at the end of this football game that they were frustrating them. And you could tell, Seattle, when you got your backs against the wall, you act one way or the other. Either you go out there and you compete and you execute and you do the things you're supposed to do, or you start to unravel. And they started to unravel. And this is a rivalry. Even though the 49ers are dominating, the 49ers team remembers because this kind of came into uh, the first part of Kyle Shanahan's era, the, the Seattle Seahawks dominating. They remember those days with Russell Wilson. There's no love lost, right? When the 49ers beat them in 2019, like that energy was real. That, that playoff game energy was real. And we've seen these battles last year in the super wild card round. Don't think Seattle didn't take that one to heart. They got blown up. And... It's just that's how this game is going to be from now on. And what a great game it was. I got to give my offensive player of the game award because, yes, I know that, you know, it's it's hard because there's like some guys that don't, des- you know, some guys that deserve it, lots of guys. But I got to give it to Debo for a second straight week. Seven catches, 149 yards. He had two touchdowns, one through the air, uh, one on the ground. Debo Samuel is my uh, straight beast offensive player 
of the game. He was just absolutely special. And so he deserves the award. And on defense, I'm going with Fred. I thought Fred had a masterful game. Eight sacks, led the team, has the big interception there. Uh, Fred has just been flying around making plays all season, but he kept things together. It didn't matter if Dre Greenlaw was out there with them or not. If Oren Burks was hurt, Bre Fred was keeping things together, making sure the defense stayed intact. He did a great job. And an unsung hero, Tashawn Gibson, managing that secondary, keeping it together. He's, he's a veteran, and he knows what he has to do. He's already been dealing with having a young safety next to him in Jair Brown. Jair Brown may have had the best game that we've seen from him. I still want to get into the All-22 film. That'll be available over on Patreon, so go check that out. Uh, but And then I want to you know just talk about the fact that you know the 49ers now have a big game against the Arizona Cardinals, a divisional matchup. I'm going to get into my first look because it's a lot different from their first time they played them when they had Josh Dobbs at quarterback. Things have changed, so that's going to be a good video. Make sure you check that out. Uh, but you know, here comes another division rival, and the 49ers need to make sure they go in there and take care of business and don't look ahead to the Ravens. I think they will. I think they're going to be focused, uh, but bird season's been going good for the 49ers, so it's going to be a fun week. Lots of content coming out this week. I hope you guys will all check it out. Of course, my upon further review. Once I've watched the All-22, I'll put out the upon further review video. You guys can check out uh, what I thought when I watched everything and broke it down, not just the TV angle, but the full thing, and I take my coaching aspect to it and look at the, the positives and the negatives. I'll find some things. I guarantee it. Uh, so if you never checked out upon further review, check that out. Then we'll have our first look, tail of the tape. Lots of stuff coming out this week. I hope you guys will come check it all out. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Appreciate it. Subscriptions help. On the way to 5K, trying to get there before the end of the season. If you're listening on audio platform, 49ers Cutback on Believe. Uh, of course, it's available on all audio platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, everywhere you listen. And, you know, it's just one of those great times to be a 49ers fan. I hope you guys are all enjoying your Victory Monday. Looking forward to more Victory Mondays coming down the road. Check out Patreon, brand new episode of the Ant Hill Show, already posted and available. Uh, there'll be standalone shows all week. Of course, the All-22 film breakdowns, all the content, all the content. Just, just go check it out. Uh, this episode of 40 Yards Cutback was brought to you by Bet Online, where the game starts. Catch you guys on the next one. Until then, stay safe and remember the right way is always the 49ers.